Well, welcome to our uh, third event of the uh, semester of the Center for Global Ethics and Politics here at the Graduate Center of City University of New York. Um, I'm delighted to have a, a premier democratic theorist, worldwide democratic theory, um, and who I will introduce, whom I will introduce in a second. I want to um, First, be sure that everyone knows that we have a reception following. Uh, John Grasek was telling me about an event in Toronto where they had drinks first and then had the talk. <laughs> but we do it in the other order. So we have a wine and juice reception that follows in uh, room um, 5109 and the globalization lounge, which many of you can go to. So while we're down there together, we don't have a chance to follow up. Uh, we're going to have to talk about the questions here, though, so that should be really exciting. So, uh, John Dreisek is a centenary professor and Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow in the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra. And he was previously distinguished professor of political science at Australian Research Council Federation Fellow at the uh, Australian National University. So um, he's very well known in several areas, uh, in particular deliberative democracy, where he was one of the originators of the uh, emphasis on deliberative democracy, and also for his work in ecological governance and um, dealing with climate governance in particular. He's the author of numerous books, um, including Democracy in Capitalist Times, Ideals, Limits, and Struggles. The Politics of the Earth is another book um, from Oxford in 2005. This is not in order here. So I'll fix up your Wikipedia. And. Um, You're not supposed to do it yourself. Right. And then there's this group. Um, and a very well known book is Deliberative Democracy and Beyond Liberals, Critics, Contestations, also from Oxford University Press in 2000. And a bunch of others. Uh, theories of the Democratic State, the Oxford Handbook of Political Theory, wow. um, and Rational Ecology, Environment and Political Economy. That was an early one. So he's been consistently working in this area of ecological political theory and governance issues. Presently, he's uh, visiting at Harvard University at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Kennedy School. I'm so delighted to have um, this fantastic theorists come by. So, friend, John Dreisig, um, who will be talking today on Democratic Agents of Justice. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, thank you, Carol, and, and thank you for organizing this, this visit. It's a pleasure to be here. As I told you, it's the, it's the, it's the first time I've given the talk in New York since um, 1980. That was the last time. That was the last time. So it's been, it's been a while. Um, yeah, so the talk is about democratic agents of justice. Um, it's, it's my contribution to bringing together the theory of democracy and the theory of justice. Uh, it seems a lot of people sort of try to do this, and the, li li the literature just on that is actually quite large over the last um, decade or more. Um, uh, Keith Dowding, Robert Goodin, and Carol Payne in a 2004 um, uh, introduction to a fesher for for Brian Barry, I um, say that the central questions about the relationship between democracy and justice remain largely unaddressed. I'm not sure they have, I'm not sure they have really been addressed, they've actually said they've been addressed by quite a few people. Um, whether they've been addressed satisfactorily is a different question. Um, I'm not going to say that, uh, that I've, I've now sort of found the key to it, but um, I'm just trying to sort of make a contribution to bring them together. And I'll do so in this talk through the reference to the, the conception of um, agents of justice, which was um, introduced um, in 2001 by um, Honora O'Neill, or to give her a full medieval title, um, Baroness O'Neill of Bengard of the Braid in the County of Antrim, CHCBD, FBA. Um, so, sorry? Can you spell that? <laughs> It'll take a while. Uh, uh, so, um, the focus will be mostly global, so we'll be talking about global justice. And so we'll be talking about global democracy by implication. And the this, this paper is, is in, in turn uh, 
part of a, a bigger project that we're working on over the, the next few years on a deliberative approach to global justice. Um, so this is not this is not the theoretical foundation for that uh, um, for that project, but it's one of the uh, one of the pillars on which it will rest. Um, that will also involve some empirical work, um, looking at the uh, uh, the process currently underway to um, develop the um, post 2015 development agenda, which assesses development goals. Well, I think in that it's widely recognised that uh, the the original process by which the goals were formulated back in 2000 um, was very much a sort of technocratic um, top-down process. It was in many ways um, unsatisfactory, but that needs to be remedied by more and more participation and deliberation. Uh, whether that happens uh, is a different question. Okay, so I'll start with the idea of agents of justice, and then what I'm going to suggest is that um, all agents of justice are in some sense problematic, and that some of their problematic features can be uh, uh, both illuminated and corrected uh, through attention to the theory of, of democracy. And what I'll do is actually run through um, some of the, uh, the agents of justice who figure large in existing uh, accounts of global justice in particular. Now, the, the idea of agents of justice, as I say, was introduced by uh, Aaron Neal. Uh, the basic idea is that agents of justice that the, the concept of agents of justice is a corrective to theories of justice which stress only the recipients of justice and the rights or goods they can claim. Um, what O'Neill argues is that any theory of justice is actually radically incomplete without also, without also containing an account of the agents upon whom the obligation to promote justice must rest. However, um, I, I think her, her own account of agency is actually unnecessary limited and primary agents and secondary agents. So you'll see the quote here, primary agents are those with the capacities to determine how principles of justice are to be institutionalized in a certain domain. Um, secondary agents are much less important. They only do what primary agents tell them. Um, so, for example, pay taxes to answer uh, distribution. The main examples of primary agents of justice, and especially when it comes to global justice, are states well, actually states very strongly, and then NGOs and corporations who she believes can enter when states are weak. Um, I would argue that she misses a very important category of agents, what I would call generative agents, whose, whose activity is actually logically prior to primary agency. Um, generative agents are those who determine what justice means. In other words, what conception of justice should be applied in a particular, particular context. So, what I will argue is that we need democracy, um, in particular, to specify what justice should be in particular contexts. And agents of justice are needed there, um, not just in the implementation of justice. Um, just to illustrate the idea of generative agency, we can start with um, some critiques that uh, uh, people like um, Andrew Cooper and Monique DeVoe have made of philosophers of global justice, uh, such as uh, Peter Singer and Tom, Thomas Poggy. Um, what Cooper argues, but well, actually devoted implicitly as well, um, is that Singer and Poggy emphasize the agency of the rich and the powerful, that the obligation to promote justice rests on them. Um, in Cooper's language, this involves treating the poor as moral agents, sorry, moral <coughs> patients who lack any agency of their own. Um, if you did involve the, the, the poor themselves, um, in, the, in the exercise of generative agency, it is not clear that they would agree that the transfer of wealth is necessarily the best policy instrument. Um, compared, for example, to um, changes in the term of trade, which would um, enable them to compete more effectively, um, or um, an improvement in their capabilities, to use the language of um, send, send, and, send and just that, um, as opposed to um, just material transfers. Monique DeVoe argues for the moral agency of the poor themselves being recognized um, on grounds other than the capacity to act and the capacity to remedy injustice. Um, so for the poor themselves, it's, it's justified on the basis of their lived experience and poverty. For pro-poor advocacy groups, their, their standing as agents of justice is, is uh, justified on the basis of um, their bearing witness to, uh, um, to the problem of poverty. So that's, that's in, in DeVoe's account. So if we take those sorts of arguments by um, Cooper and DeVoe seriously, then it seems 
that the kind of agency they propose to the poor is actually of a higher order than the agency of the rich and global elites, as identified by Hoggy and Singer, um, because it refers to what justice should mean in particular contexts. It's not just uh, an obligation resting on the agent in question. Okay, I will argue that the standing of all agents of justice proves problematic or contestable, and that democracy can do two things. It can, it can provide, it enables, it enables to identify corrective mechanisms in some cases, the problematic features of the agency. Um, and a, a democratic theory can also provide criteria for assessing the standing of the particular category, categories of agents. So what I'm going to look at is, uh, I'm going to look at the agents who loom large in existing accounts of global justice. So um, notably states, international organizations, the rich, the poor, advocacy groups, public intellectuals, corporations, and citizens. So there's a lot of them. Uh, and so uh, I, so the tour, my tour through the agents is actually relatively brief, and perhaps doesn't do justice to all that could be, all that could be, all that could be said about them. Um, but I'm trying to sort of squeeze them all into um, this, this paper and this presentation. Um, but before I get on to particular agents, um, let me just uh, point to one pervasive problem that characterizes agency in, in, in global just, when it comes to global justice. And that is the uh, widespread tendency um, in practice to, just, to define justice in terms that serve the self-interest of the agent in question. Um, and so we can see this, we can see this in global, negation, global negotiations. I do, I've done a lot of work on climate change in recent years. Um, the language of justice actually pervades global negotiations on climate change, but different actors invoke justice selectively. And the concept of justice they invoke um, generally serves their own material interest. So for the US, traditionally, justice meant fairness in terms of trade. Um, they didn't want to unfairly uh, benefit their uh, competitors, such as China. Um, for China, and especially in developing countries, um, justice is much more historical. Um, it rests on the idea that um, those who, whose prosperity was built on a history of global, sorry, a history of greenhouse gas emissions, a long history of greenhouse gas emissions, um, have a primary responsibility for cutting back on emissions in the future. And that argument is in turn um, generally rejected by the US and other developing countries. Um, so there is this, this widespread tendency to uh, define justice in ways that serve self-interest um, in, in global interactions, especially global negotiations. The theory of democracy could illustrate this by asking when and when is it not legitimate to pursue material self-interest um, in political interaction. And there's a recent article in the Journal of Political Philosophy by Jenny Mansbridge um, and several co-authors um, in which she argues that legitimate it is that self-interest in political deliberation is that can be legitimate. Um, however, uh, we should subject any self-interest claims to deliberative constraints, um, especially the constraints of mutual respect, um, reciprocity, and uh, mutual justification. Um, so you have to, so then you have to um, argue for your self-interest um, in terms that uh, um, that have sort of more general applicability. So there's nothing wrong with, say, um, again, to use a climate change example, um, a small island state to assert its self-interest in not being drowned, you know, maybe, maybe material self-interest. But it's not hard to uh, uh, to justify that in, deliberate, in, in, in these sort of kinds of terms. Um, and once we do uh, um, invoke these sorts of constraints on self-interested arguments, then I can really get a, a mechanism, a kind of a credibility mechanism um, as well. Um, uh, Jon Elster, in the context of um, political liberation, is referred to as a civilizing force of hypocrisy. So even people who, at heart, are pursuing um, material self-interest, so to give the example, just an example of, um, uh, of, of climate change that I mentioned a few moments ago, even if the, the US and China uh, and other countries are using the language of justice to as a cover for self-interest, um, what else to call a civilizing force of hypocrisy can come into play. Um, what this means ultimately is that proposals, uh, proposals in, 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 in interactions will only be framed in terms that are responsive to the public justifications rather than the privately held interests. 
progress, or at least that's, um, that's the ideal mechanism. Um, we, in, the, in the context of climate change, that's not a mechanism we've actually seen um, uh, being decisive in the past. There seem to be all kinds of um, barriers to something like that happening. But at least we can envisage it. Okay. Um, actually, sorry, I should have put this slide up earlier. Um, uh, in fact, that did, yeah, sorry, that does summarize the, the, uh, what, what I just said. Um, okay, so now that we've run through um, some particular categories of agents who, uh, who, as I say, do loom large in existing accounts of global justice, and see what we can say about them in democratic terms. Um, staying with the climate change example, uh, Yeah, um, states do, I mean, this is obviously not a state, this is a, this is a social movement, um, uh, asserting, the, asserting climate justice. Um, as I say, uh, when, when it comes to climate justice, um, states do tend to use the, the language of justice a lot. Um, however, their claims would have much more credibility, and so the credibility mechanism that I just mentioned might come into play, um, if they accepted that the principles that, that they urge upon others um, should also apply to themselves. Um, so, for example, in the case of China, uh, China makes the historical justice argument, um, in, in, or has historically made the, the historical justice argument um, in saying, insisting that it's the, uh, the, the, the more wealthy countries who bear the burden for future emissions reduction. Um, although, actually, in, in its agreement with the um, in the agreement between China and the US and a, few, a few days ago, China really for the first time in a serious way um, accepts that it does have a, a responsibility to cut back and has made commitments to do so. Um, but it could make, but if, but if, but if, it wanted to, if China wanted to make the historical justice um, argument more compelling to those who don't originally share uh, that, that view of justice, um, one way of doing so would be to accept that, uh, that the argument the historical justice argument applies to its own population of rich consumers as much as it applies to rich consumers in the West. Um, so China itself has a population of around 100 million wealthy consumers who have built their own prosperity on the history of fossil fuel use. And so, um, so China, um, if it wanted to advance the credibility of the historical justice argument on the world stage, to say, yes, that would be advance the argument and we accept that it applies to this 100 million within China as well as the West. And that would immediately um, um, introduce, um, um, introduce credibility in global, in global negotiations. Um, okay, so, so there is that kind of, that, that, that potential credibility um, mechanism that can operate in conjunction with, um, with, 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 with publicity. Okay, um, I'm going to move through, through, through agents fairly quickly here. Um, there is actually more I can say about states, but um, I won't for the moment. Um, we can perhaps return to that kind of time later. Um, second, the second category of, um, of agents of justice who loom large in the existing council of justice are international organizations. Um, so uh, international relations theorist Tony Erskine, for example, um, uh, has written extensively on the idea that international organizations can be treated as moral agents. Um, so they are, uh, they are, they are important collective agents. Now, um, sometimes international organizations can develop strong self-interests of their own, um, in which case uh, we can, as, as democratic theorists, um, we can speak to that, to speak to assertions of self-interest um, in, sorry, we, we, can, we can speak to um, international organisations um, defining justice in, in ways that serve themselves, in, in just using just the uh, just the kind of mechanism that I talked about, the mechanisms, the, me the relative constraints that Jane Matthews talks about, um, along with the publicity mechanism that, that I mentioned. Um, to the extent that um, uh, the international organisations are conditioned by treaties that set them up, and then don't uh, don't necessarily have the capacity to. Uh, uh, to be autonomous agents, um, then uh, 
that means uh, that those organizations, that international organizations are often, uh, their imperatives are often consistent with the material interests of the states negotiating them. Um, and sometimes that can, that can freeze injustice into the way an international organization works. Um, so, for example, the, the so-called Washington Consensus around uh, um, neoliberal economics uh, was adopted um, and long enforced by the, um, uh, the, the IMF, the, the World Bank, um, and uh, arguably, sort of, arguably froze a particular uh, conception of, of, of justice, which many people would see as um, highly unjust. Um, so, um, so what, well, what's the remedy here? Um, uh, ideally, international organisations should be able to develop a much more critical and reflexive capacity of the sort that we often um, associate with, um, with pluralism within states. Um, increasingly democratic theorists are talking about the possibility of, well, Carol amongst others, um, uh, talking about the possibility of introducing democratic devices into the global system, into global politics. So global politics has long been resistant to um, any notion of democracy or democratization. But there is, um, there is a growing literature on global democracy, and you know, different, uh, different scholars talk about different things. So there might be um, uh, sort of the maximal um, institutions of cosmopolitan democracy, as um, advocated by David Helm and others. Um, other people um, have put the stress on um, mechanisms of civil society. Um, James Bowman talks about international regimes of societal democratization. Uh, we might think about the role roles of social movements, as the transnational social movements as well. Um, but the general idea um, is that we can think about international organizations developing a more reflexive capacity uh, uh, when it comes to the uh, when, when it comes to um, notions of justice or injustice that they advance, um, and that reflexive capacity in turn um, can be promoted. By these sorts, by these devices of, um, of, of transnational and global democratization. Okay, um, next category of agents: um, uh, the rich. Um, obviously, the rich are those with the resources who, who could redistribute, and so, um, as, as, so they, they, they could be um, targeted as um, primary agents of justice um, by. In, in an or a male's um, sense. Um, now, um, here there is a, a, it's not a universal tendency, uh, but there is a tendency amongst those who are wealthy to, to define justice um, in terms which suits their own interest. Um, so libertarian and trickle-down conceptions of justice um, are likely to be um, especially pervasive of, among the rich. Um, but even if, um, uh, even if um, we can overcome that problem, I mean, it's exactly the way that I've talked about before in terms of um, uh, credibility and publicity mechanisms. Um, even if, um, if you overcome that problem, the problem of um, justice being defined in terms which suit the self-interest of the rich, um, relying solely on the agency of the rich um, violates, the, violates um, one particular conception of freedom, which itself is um, central to um, some conceptions of, um, of justice, some especially Republican conceptions of justice, which is the idea of freedom, freedom of non Freedom is non-domination. Um, um, any stress on the agency of the rich as the main agents of global justice um, risks the, the poor becoming treated as, again, it's what um, Andrew Cooper would call moral patients, and so it's a violation of freedom of non-domination. Even if the rich are being or acting in uh, very well-meaning philanthropic terms, so thinking of somebody like Bill Gates, for example, giving um, uh, vast amounts of, of, of money to um, um, to cure diseases in, in the third world. Um, uh, if, it's, um, if, if, the, if, the, if, we, if we simply rely on Bill Gates as an, an agent of justice, um, no matter the, 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 the material benefits of what, what he's doing, um, if agency is confined to people like him alone, um, then that does violate um, the, the idea of um, the freedom of non-domination. So what's the democratic correction? Um, well, extend agency beyond the rich. Um, somehow try to involve those, uh, um, involve the global poor in particular. Um, extending agency beyond the rich means simply moving from plutocracy in the direction of more democracy, and that would apply um, the global level and no less than anywhere else. Um, so what about the poor? Um, there is a moral case uh, for treating the poor as agents of justice, as emphasized by um, Cooper and DeVoe, who mentioned at the, um, at the outset. 
Um, however, um, the poor themselves are problematic agents of justice um, for very different reasons than the, the rich. Um, the main problem is that they often seem to lack the capacity to exercise agency. Uh, they don't have the resources, the time, the education. Uh, they're often, uh, uh, they don't have the, the linguistic capacities to, to make arguments in, in the political arena. So when somebody like Monique DeVoe um, argues for the, the, for the moral agency of the poor on philosophical grounds, she doesn't actually say um, how it should be exercised in practice. Now, um, in amongst the liberative Democrats, um, perhaps the, the most popular solution uh, to this question is, well, well, why don't we just redistribute? Um, why don't we provide the poor with the material conditions which would make them effective deliberators? And that's kind of the sort of the social democratic uh, version of deliberative democracy, if you like. Um, I would associate that in particular with um, uh, Amy Gutman and Dennis Thompson and their, their book, um, Democracy and Disagreement. Um, it's one of the foundational texts of deliberative democracy. Um, I think that there's actually a conceptual problem here, though. Um, because if you think that to become agents, the poor must be provided with material conditions to enable agency, that means they're no longer poor. Um, this makes the poor the recipients of justice who can only exercise agency when they are no longer poor. Okay? So it already assumes that we know what justice requires. And so it's actually uh, implicitly um, denied the generative agency of the poor to specify what justice means. Um, so what else can we do? Um, if we can't, if we don't wait for redistribution, um, what I would argue is that, is that there are in fact institutional designs that can be deployed to enable the effective agency of the poor without waiting for material redistribution. Um, my best um, empirical example actually comes from the work of um, Fiji Andrew Rao and his uh, colleagues on uh, Ram Sabas in South India. Uh, that's a Ram Sabha. Um, it's a village, um, a, a state mandated um, uh, village assemblies. Um, what uh, Rao argues is that the Ram Sabas um, enable the participation of the poor. Um, especially when it comes to the provision of welfare. Um, to quote um, Rao, uh, the Grand Sabha, at least in South India, seems not to work this way in all of India, um, it, it creates a level discursive field, it briefly releases people from inequality traps and allows them the freedom to speak. Um, and just another quote from him, um, deliberation shapes the meaning of poverty. Um, it's very contestatory deliberation. Um, uh, it's con contested uh, across caste lines, across um, uh, uh, people with different, um, di different levels, levels of wealth. Um, but in the Grand Suburbs, the Grand Suburbs do seem to enable um, effective deliberative participation in defining what justice means in a local context. Um, and a challenge, really, a, a, ch a challenge to the kind of um, hierarchy that pervades a caste divided society. Now, oh, it's a big stretch from Grand Sabha in, a, in an Indian village to the global level. Um, what I would argue, though, is that uh, at the global level, we simply have the same problems um, writ large, so the solutions need to be writ large, too. Um, but we can think of uh, um, institutional designs at the global level, uh, which would uh, more effectively enable the direct participation of the of, of the poor themselves. Um, now remember, at the outset, um, I said that this was the, this is going to sort of feed into some empirical work on the, the post-2015 development agenda. Um, so the uh, yeah, so the um, so I think it's widely recognised that um, last time round um, there was no participation on part of the, of the global poor in the development in the Latin development goals, and this time there should be um, something to be done better. Quite what should be done um, is a matter of um, some contention. Um, what I would argue um, that it's actually possible to uh, to run transnational citizens assemblies. Um, there are there are precedents. Um, the best precedent is um, actually this is yeah, some pictures from something called Worldwide Views, which has run a, um, which has been run twice now. Um, once on biodiversity. Um, the first one was actually on climate change. Um, the basic idea is to um, run citizen deliberations 
on the same topic on the same day um, in a large number of different countries. So for climate change, it was um, 38 countries in 2009. Um, in, uh, on, Biodiversity in 2012 was slightly smaller, it's 26 countries. And the idea of both was to feed into the um, to subsequent global um, UN sponsored negotiations. Um, the design that the World Wide Views employed was um, to select more or less at random, although particulars vary by country, um, 100 citizens to um, deliberate for a day on the, uh, on the issue in question. Um, now, what I would argue is that it would be possible to sort of build on that precedent, to, um, but then do two things. Um, the first would involve targeted recruitment, um, to make sure that you got um, participation from the, the, the poor and the marginalised, um, and not just from relatively articulate citizens in each country. Um, the second thing would be to bring together representatives from each of, the, uh, each of the national forums that was held, and bring them together in global deliberations. And that could be done in a very high-profile way. Um, in parallel, for example, with the, uh, the Conference of the Parties that um, uh, the uh, uh, UN um, Framework Convention on Climate Change runs every year, and which the um, Framework Convention on uh, Biological Diversity runs every two years. Um, that hasn't been done, um, but I don't, see that, I don't think there's any reason why one couldn't do it. Um, you, you have to sort of think long and hard about um, how to make this effective. You can't just sort of pluck people out of their countries and uh, bring them to... Um, uh, wherever the negotiations being held, and expect them to be effective liberators. Um, so, they, so it might involve um, providing them with um, materials which make sense to people who are not necessarily even uh, literate. Um, it might provide um, uh, prior deliberation with similarly situated others, as a kind of a sort of a confidence building um, exercise. Um, it, it would involve certain. Would, Certainly would involve tar targeted recruitment rather than just like with the line on random, on random selection. Um, but I think it can be done. Um, in terms of, there's obviously a language problem, um, but language problems have already been dealt with successfully in other transnational liberations um, through, through things like simultaneous translation. So that problem is not, is not insuperable. Um, so, so it could be done. Well, it hasn't been done yet. Um, the general point is that institutional design, as informed by democratic theory, um, could. Uh, could, could do this. Okay. Um, what happens um, in global deliberations currently well, is that um, the poor themselves are generally absent and their place is often taken by advocacy groups who advocate on behalf of the poor. Um, advocacy groups and activists. Um, now, these are um, obviously generally well meaning. Um, however, there is a, there is a they, they do have, there is a problematic character um, attending advocacy groups and activists when it comes to global justice. And the problem is that they're often, um, often self-appointed and their representation claims can, can be highly controversial. Um, so, for example, when it comes to well, one of the most famous celebrity activists, um, uh, on, especially on poverty issues this, over the last um, decade, or has, been, um, has been Bono. Um, Bono has been criticised. Uh, you know, he, he actually um, in the famous quote in 2004. He says, "I represent a lot of people in Africa. They have a to represent them." Uh, so that's a representation claim. Uh, it's a claim to agency on uh, on it's, uh, it's a claim to his own standing as an agent of justice um, in a situation where the African poor themselves are not present. Um, so he's been criticised for constructing Africa and the African poor in a particular kind of way. It's not having much in the way of agency of their own. It's just being the uh, it's just being claimants upon the charity of the, uh, the rich and the powerful. Um, so Bono is coming for a lot of a lot of criticism. Um, there's a campaign in Africa that's called "Not About Us Without Us," um, which is directly uh, directly challenges the claim to uh, agency of somebody like Bono. Um, some more unkind people have suggested that the, um, uh, we really need to make Bono history. Obviously, it's a play on the make poverty history spoken of Bono himself, on himself, and the views. Um, in fairness to Bono himself, he, when he was pursued by protesters with this slogan um, a, a year or so ago, he, he thought it was very clever and uh, sort of congratulated them, even as being, even he was, um, he was fleeing from them. Um, so, what can democratic theory do here? Um, it can uh, 
um, it, we can apply the democratic theory of representation. And so in recent years, there's been a lot of work on, um, on unelected and self-appointed representatives, not just dismissing their claims as being illegitimate on grounds that they can't be uh, uh, the topic of um, conventional democratic standards, standards of authorization and accountability, uh, but trying to think, well, what standards can we apply instead? Um, so Laura Montanero, in her article on um, unelected representatives in the Journal of Politics a couple of, a couple of years ago, suggests that, we, that the standard we apply is that um, we should ask of self-appointed representatives whether, they are, whether what they do actually helps create a constituency uh, which could then uh, demand accountability of the representative in question, um, rather than the representative uh, substituting for that constituency. And in that sense, um, I think the uh, Bono is certainly highly problematic. Um, but the general point there is that there are resources in democratic theory to assess the claims of uh, uh, unelected, self-appointed advocates of global justice. So we, just, we just need to um, apply the dem recent democratic theory of representation. Okay, um, so just sipping through uh, other agents here. Um, public intellectuals. Um, A number of philosophers of social justice um, do try to reach out beyond the academy and into, into the broader public sphere. So, um, why are public intellectuals problematic? Um, well, they disagree with each other. I mean, philosophers thrive on disagreement, so it's no problem within the academy. Um, when, when, but in the public sphere, uh, it, it, does become, it, it, it does become more problematic. So what do we do about disagreement? How do we decide um, uh, what principles of justice to um, uh, uh, to pursue in particular context, context, given disagreement amongst public intellectuals who, who advance those principles? Um, uh, well, there are different ways, ways, of, ways of different ways of doing it. Um, one is to simply assert the uh, superiority of a particular, or argue for the superiority of a um, of a particular conception of justice. And certainly, not all theorists of global justice are moral pluralists. Um, they really do believe, some of them, uh, Peter Singer, for example, he really does believe he has got the global justice right. Um, uh, however, um, uh, once we accept um, the possibility of reasonable disagreement about different conceptions of global justice, um, that means that that, means that, one, that one can do. Um, going public, becoming a, 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 a public intellectual and advancing one's um, moral claims on, on the world stage um, means that one opens oneself to a range of in, 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 interlocutors um, beyond the academy. And so that starts to look um, something like a deliberative democratic process. Um, and a number, of, um, a, a number of philosophers have recognized that. Um, so people like um, Marcia Sen, um, Nancy Fraser, um, Laura Valentini, all of whom recognize the existence of um, reasonable pluralism and justice claims, um, and all of them um, are sort of talking so in slightly different ways about the need um, for some kind of deliberative process um, to reconcile uh, uh, plural justice claims. Um, I've, I myself, in a paper that's published in the European Journal of Political Theory last year, um, that the theory of deliberative democracy actually provides a lot of resources uh, for figuring out exactly what a deliberative system should look like in a global context um, for, uh, uh, for reconciling plural justice claims. I won't go into the details, um, uh, but there are, all, all I will say is that there are resources there in the theory of deliberative democracy for, uh, uh, for reconciling plural justice claims through deliberative democracy. Um, okay, um, again, just sort of zipping through the, um, the categories of um, agents of justice here. Um, corporations. Uh, Nora O'Neill, who I mentioned at the beginning, says that corporations can be primary agents of justice um, when states are weak. Um, I actually think it's hard to muster any kind of uh, democratic case for the generative or primary agency of corporations. Um, on the grounds uh, that they are unreliable, highly unreliable agents of justice, um, that they are hardwired hard wired for profit, um, and so very, very likely to um, define justice in terms of serve their own, own self-interest. 
Um, so there is, I think, just at least no democratic case to muster that I can think of there. Um, okay, citizens. Uh, um, citizens, um, not surprisingly, um, figure large in um, theories of justice. Sorry, citizens figure large in theories of democracy, and they can actually be quite elusive when in theories of justice. Um, real, well, real citizens, though, um, can be problematic in uh, in a number of ways. Um, they can be pro problematic, especially when it comes to um, again quite the question of, um, of competence. Their, their judgments are fallible. Um, here we can um, draw on recent work in um, epistemic democracy. I'm thinking especially of um, um, book by, uh, very good book by um, Helene Vandenberg on democratic reason, um, in which she argues uh, that um, cognitive diversity um, across individuals can compensate the fallibility, um, the fallibility of particular individuals. And here she think, draws on things like um, well, the Condorcet-Jury theorem, um, the wisdom of crowds. Um, she ends up arguing that democratic reason is best served by um, a combination of liberation and majority rule. I mean, we could sort of debate specifics there, but the general point is um, that there is such a thing as democratic reason, which can compensate for the fallibility of citizens when it comes to democratic judgments. Or, sorry, when it comes to judgments in democratic systems. And those judgments can be about um, questions of justice, but it's no less than anything else. Um, so, um, so that's the, the, if you like, the, yeah, the democratic reason solution to the problematic character of citizens, of ordinary citizens, as, as, as agents of justice, um, to the extent that we can organize their participation somehow, um, both directly or indirectly, um, in the process that determine principles of global justice. Um, there's also a, a question of um, the, the question of um, uh, defining justice to serve self-interest um, is liable to rise with, with, with individuals, um, individual citizens, as much as um, as much as um, other actors, as much as collective actors. As I thought I talked about earlier, and so the same remedies apply. Um, the ones, the remedies um, um, in terms of uh, man, man's bridges, uh, stress on deliberative constraints on what what, can, what, what, what should be argued in the public sphere. And also the kind of publicity and credibility mechanisms that um, um, can build on that. Um, okay. So, um, so I've, got, I've obviously gone through those categories of agents very quickly, uh, and perhaps I've um, done justice to all the democratic um, mechanisms that can be applied to um, each one of each one of those categories. Um, as a counter argument to my basic point about the necessity for these democratic mechanisms and standards, um, it could be argued, well, what about the possibility of non-democratic mechanisms that could do the same trick? Um, what I would argue is that um, even if we can identify such a mechanism, um, then it must either be able, it must either provide a complete substitute for the mechanisms, the democratic mechanisms I'm talking about, um, or be able to coexist with democracy. Um, so, for example, if we were to invoke the possibility of a benevolent dictator as a, as a generative um, primary agent of justice, um, that would indeed provide a complete substitute. Um, it would not coexist with, uh, it could not, of course, um, coexist with um, the democratic mechanisms that I've talked about. Um, a benevolent di dictator, though, would, would be, would in fact be um, truly problematic um, in uh, not just in terms of, uh, of, of democratic theory, but also in terms of theory of justice. Um, so if Cooper is right, if Cooper and DeVoe uh, are right, um, then about, um, um, about the, the need for the agency of the court themselves when it comes to process of global justice. Um, a benevolent dictator, um, no matter how well-meaning, no matter how well-informed by uh, some of the theories of justice, would still treat people as moral patients. Um, a system of benevolent dictatorship would still treat people as moral patients, which violates the idea, idea of freedom as non-domination, which um, is itself um, central to, um, to some conceptions of justice. 
um, so let run with it. Um, well, what any other ideas apart from apart from uh, benevolent dictatorship? Um, which of course, it's highly unlikely anyway. But even assuming we could get it, um, what other ideas? Um, uh, well, it would be good, perhaps, if everyone could set aside their self-interest um, and commit themselves to a shared morality. But that's not the way. That's not in, again. That's not anything like the way the real the real world works. Um, especially, um, especially once we recognise, and, and then we, we, even if, even if, even if um, everyone did set aside their self-interest um, and committed in some way to to the uh, pursuit and the practice of justice, um, we would still be faced with the problem uh, that there will be disagreement about what justice entails. I mean, we would still we'd still need some kind of mechanism to reconcile that disagreement. Okay. Um, Actually, what well, I've talked for long enough, so um, actually a bit too long. So I'm going to skip over the uh, um, the, the next part of the paper, which actually um, looks at the interaction of different categories of agents of justice. Because um, it, it's very rarely going to be the case that we could rely on one particular category to be fully responsible for the uh, for the pursuit um, and implementation of, of justice. Um, it's more realistic to um, have to, 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 to think in terms of, um, all, of a number of different categories of agents interacting. Um, and well, I don't have time to sort of go into the argument, but all, all I will say is that the, the interaction of large numbers of uh, um, agents um, who decide uh, collectively what kinds of standards of justice should apply, what action should be taken um, in pursuit of those. Uh, those standards um, begins to sound a lot like democracy, um, and we can. Uh, it's possible to look um, in, in much finer grain detail at the interaction of particular kinds of categories. And I do that. Um, I do that with the paper, but I'll skip over that for the moment. Um, community of accounts of democracy, be they deliberative or otherwise, are especially well placed to scrutinise the interaction of different categories of agents, uh, such as um, advocacy groups, the poor, um, states, international organisations. Um, so, um, I'll just conclude with a few slogans, a few simple take-home messages. Um, no justice without agents of justice, that's Honora O'Neill's point. Um, what I would argue is that there are no effective agents of justice without democracy. Um, and so, in the end, uh, there is no global justice without global democracy. Um, I'll finish that. Comments. Okay. Please uh, identify yourself for your for the video. Okay, great. Um, I'm Nicholas Campio. I teach political theory at Fordham University. And um, I guess what I, the whole time you were talking, I was thinking about. I brought a, a group of students to the UN last fall, and when you walk inside the main building on the left, there's this huge picture of Bill Gates. <laughs> okay. And then right next to the picture is the list of corporate sponsors. And so this seems strikes me as really problematic. And I mean, I'm, I, for the last couple of years, I've been focusing on education. And what I've seen is, um, you know, basically somebody gets an idea to Bill Gates, and all of a sudden it becomes a public policy supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, it's sort of taken up by the UN. And so I'm trying to figure out, what, the whole time we were talking about this, how can democracy stand a chance? against this. And my, my more pointed question is, why should we keep supporting the UN when right now they're undemocratic? And the only hope is that someday, maybe some global democracy, that they will happen. Yeah. Okay, um, good question. Why should we keep supporting the UN? Um, I'm, I, I, I think um, global democratic theorists um, divide on this. Um, I mean, some, some people uh, think that the route to democ global democracy lies through the UN um, and through uh, something, I mean, this is just to be, um, uh, I guess, the, uh, the hardline cosmopolitan Democrats' um, viewpoint. Um, so, uh, so people like David Hell, but even more so, um, I think, um, uh, sorry? Yeah, and um, uh, Raf Raphael uh, uh, Marchetti, Marchetti um, would see um, 
Oh, and, and uh, there's another Akibuchi, the other Akibuchi, the one that... Yeah, Matthias. Yeah, Matthias. Yeah. 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 So he, he's very yeah. insistent that, um, that this, yeah, that the route to global democracy lies through um, uh, elections to something, well, something like the, like, like the General Assembly, so it would be elected. Um, the it's Senate. Richard Falk as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I'm certainly much less keen on that, that route to global democracy. And I, I, um, I, I think the UN is, um, is, is highly problematic for a, num for a number of reasons, I'm including the one I, I didn't know about the uh, picture of Bill Gates. Uh, uh, um, but um, uh, um, I mean, my, my approach to global democratization would, um, very, would very much emphasize um, uh, much more of a sort of a bottom-up uh, process, which emphasizes the activities of um, uh, trans transnational social movements um, and experimentation with new forms of, um, of transnational democratic governance, um, rather than uh, simply relying on the reform of the, 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 the old forms. Um, and again, having having worked a lot on climate change, I'm sort of very conscious of the deficiencies of the. Um, the, the UN process, and there is a there is a real danger there that um, that the 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 UN the UN climate change negotiations they they form such a big focus um, of the activities of so many people. Um, so uh, all the, all the NGOs, um, all the social movements, all the activists sort of show up every year at global negotiations, um, and they absorb a huge amount of energy, and then think, oh, to what effect? Uh, could they be doing something uh, uh, potentially more useful in other locations? So. Uh, uh, just to follow up on that last point, I wonder if you, uh, Jeff Lucien in philosophy here, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the uh, interacting agents and how you see uh, that taking place and you know, what constraints there on are, if any, on participation in that uh, uh, dialogue, that global dialogue? What institutions would need to be in place for that kind of global dialogue to even be possible? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, in other words, give the rest of the opinion. Okay. Um, I'd start with the, um, let me just give you, uh, giving you giving a, a complete picture, I think would, would take a very long time, but I'll, I'll just sort of add some, add some piece, add some bits to the picture. Um, um, one thing we need to do is think about the relationship between um, uh, the poor themselves and, and more formal institutions. Um, again, we can, we can do that, um, at the, at, the local, at the local level, if it's the example of the ground suburbs in, in India suggests that that can be done. So, um, again, let me just give you another quote from um, Brown and some of his co authors. It is the more disadvantaged of social groups who attend village meetings, um, holding such meetings improves the targeting of resources towards immediate groups. Um, so, what, there, what we have there is um, a link between the what I would call the generative agency of the poor and the primary agency of local governments. Um, so we need to think about how that can be done at the, the global level. Um, I've, I've tried to suggest um, how it could be done by convening um, transnational citizens' assemblies. Um, but we would then need to think about um, connecting those things with um, both the formal institutions of transnational governments um, and the efforts of advocacy groups. Um, uh, we can think about the, the link between advocacy groups in the poor in the terms of, in the th in terms of theory of representation which, um, which, I, mentioned, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but then we still, but then once we've got that relationship, that horizontal relationship in good order, and also ideally to get direct participation in the poor themselves, um, we then need to think about, well, how do we, um, how do we link that to the, 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 the primary agency of international organizations um, and the primary agency of states in the, in the international system. And that's where, um, yeah, that's where some really big challenges would come in. And that, um, uh, I think that would imply um, uh, reform of the, the more formal institutions, um, such as the UN, in ways that enable them to, um, 
to listen more effectively. Um, it would involve thinking about the, the different means of transmission from what goes on in um, civil society to those more formal sites of um, decision. Um, and um, the, the, the forms of transmission themselves um, might, might be relatively democratic, sorry, relatively deliberative, the forms of sort of actually sort of making arguments appealing to a um, particular principle of justice. Um, they might be um, more disruptive. Um, and so, uh, uh, in, in the context of um, climate change um, negotiations, for example, it seems that um, it is possible to induce reflection amongst the negotiators um, by, th by, by doing things that aren't disruptive. And some of the activities of um, the like climate, um, climate Action Network, for example, can be, um, can be seen that, can be seen that light. They involve ridicule and shaming um, rather than a sort of more, more civil sort of interaction. Um, um, that, that's just um, um, yeah. That's just um, one little piece of that particular political system. That particular political system. Um, um, I think what, what we actually need to do is um, um, engage in um, uh, sort of fine-grained analyses of particular cases, um, trying to look at what the um, obstacles to uh, 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 to effective uh, transmission are. Um, try and figure out what the obstacles to accountability are, and then wait ways of overcoming them. So, uh, I actually did a, um, I co-authored a, a, a book on global climate governance um, that came out earlier this year, and it's called Democratizing Global Climate Governance. Um, and it, it treats, it attempts to analyze the deliberative system for climate governance in exactly those terms. Um, there is the, in, in terms of what to do, uh, the last one chapter of the book um, actually has a, a, a series of about sort of 15 suggestions about um, ways to um, uh, put that deliberative system in, in better order. Not just when it comes to, uh, not just for the sake of um, global justice, um, but for also, also for, this, for the sake of global climate justice, but also just for the sake of um, somehow effectively responding to this, um, this huge collective um, problem of climate change that we face. Um, yeah, so um, there, is plenty, there, are, um, uh, there are plenty of resources, um, is the short story, in the deliberative systems approach, which now uh, uh, is, is so prominent within the theory of deliberative democracy, and that can be applied, I think, at any level, um, from the local to the national to, to the global. Let me just remind you to project, if you don't mind, because okay. there's a lot of noise. Um, Let's try Eric, who's present students, and then I'll go back. Um, my name is Eric Behrens. I'm a PhD student here in philosophy. Um, so you brought up the problem of, it seems like you're, you're trying to uh, avoid the problem of what you call moral patience. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me like there's some a category or certain people who are moral patients that it would be hard to avoid them being such. So like the disabled, <coughs> children, um, you know, people like that. So. How would you suggest doing yeah. there for that? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I didn't didn't address those, those such such categories. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, there I think it's a question of, of degree. That um, uh, as, as 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 far as I mean, this this applies the Laura Montanaro argument, which I alluded to. Um, that um, as as far as possible. Uh, one sh one in one's representation activities, one should try and create a constituency amongst, other, amongst those people um, who can um, who can subsequently hold hold you to account as representatives. Now, it, it, I think in, in in the case of um, children and maybe intellectually disabled, uh, that um, that is always going to be a question of degree and never an absolute. Um, it's much more straightforward if you're dealing with, say, the global poor and marginalised. Um, uh, but it, it, it is an issue there, and, uh, and I think at the moment I have, yeah, um, beyond what I've just said, I'm, I'm not sure what the um, uh, what, what the answer is. Um, but there, you have you obviously you, you have to rely much more extensively on on advocates um, rather than the uh, rather than individuals themselves. And so, yeah, ethical standards for those advocates. Um, and, um, and those ethical standards can be not, and um, that they can, uh, I, I, 
I, mean, I haven't thought this through, um, but I would, I would think that the kind of communicative ethics one finds in, in, in democratic theory could, could be applied there. Uh, Jesse? Uh, Jesse Spafford, I'm also a PhD student in philosophy here. Um, I have a sort of follow-up question, I guess, in more about the principle of moral patience. Like, I, I, I see this as being a very serious concern, um, but I wonder to what extent it's an avoidable problem, uh, less because of the particular sorts of people who would be considered moral patients, but more just in that it seems as though you're suggesting that being treated as a moral patient is in its own way a violation of justice, and that then justice demands that we provide people with some sort of democratic procedure to resolve this problem. But I just wonder, I worry just that, that it seems to me to sort of be treating people still as moral patients. It's just they're a different sort of moral patient rather than, say, like an economic victim. They're a victim of a lack of democracy. Yeah. And so then I wonder if you then are providing them with democracy or democratic sort of institutions. Isn't that, that seems to me to be sort of analogous to just providing people directly with money. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, so give them democracy instead of giving them money, and it's still, uh, right. it's still a form of domination. Um, yeah, okay, I hadn't thought of that. Um, uh, When was, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, one, one way of, one, one way of, I mean, in a sense, there's, there's no absolute solution to that. Um, uh, if, um, but at least when it comes to democracy, it's possible to be um, reflexive in, in the sense that, um, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about institutional design um, as, a, as a way of involving the, the, the poor directly. Um, and, and that can be, yeah, that can be seen, I mean, any institutional design can be, can be seen as in some ways manipulative. Um, but it would be good to sort of build some kind of reflexivity into that so that um, uh, the people you involve in it um, could then object to the institutional design itself. And, uh, uh, and uh, suggest better ways of doing it, different, 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 different ways of doing it. So um, because they don't get rid of democracy in the process. Yeah, well, I, I think that would be highly unlikely, actually, yeah. um, if you have faith in ordinary people. Um, so that's, I mean, again, I haven't thought this one through, but that, at the moment, that's the best, that's the best answer I can think of. Sybil? Um, yeah. Um, thank you. I, I, one is just a little question of clarification, and the other is sort of uh, where I'm, I want to just push you on the whole idea of delivery of democracy, the stress on it. Mm -hmm. um, the first is, uh, was just you were talking about um, transnational citizen assemblies, and you said, but we need targeted recruitment. Yeah. And I just was wondering who's doing the targeting and, yeah. you know, the yeah. recruitment. <laughs> um, yeah. Because you didn't want self elected or there's something wrong with self yeah. So how are you conceiving that? Yeah. If do you want to answer that and just then I have a follow up with Yeah. I mean in a way that sort of relates to the, the previous question because it's um, uh, obviously it needs targeted recruitment suggests that uh, uh, that somebody's doing the targeting and so they're deciding what kind of person that um, you want in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, what all I would say there is that um, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're designing institutions and you're, you're trying to, I mean, you, 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 if, you, if you're trying to design global deliberations, or if, you're, if you're interested in global deliberations, and clearly, um, you know, there are billions of poor and marginalized people in, in the world, and it's impossible to organize all of them. So, um, at some point, uh, the, the process uh, has to be selective. So that's a question on, 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 what, on what grounds. Um, I think, um, uh, um, so I think with, so within, within those sorts of constraints, I think we just try and do the best we can. Um, that uh, um, so if we're I don't know if we're in India, we, we try to make sure that we do uh, uh, we do recruit lo lower caste individuals, but not necessarily and the people who are the most articulate um, and are already sort of occupying um, advocacy and leadership positions. Um, because those people are in some ways not, they're not typical. And, and so, so there is in one sense that they're not um, necessarily uh, uh, the best representatives. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, um, uh, I, I think, 
uh, so you know, the, the very fact that you'll have somebody doing the targeting, and there will be all kinds of um, incentives on that somebody to um, perhaps take the path. Uh, there, there may be points at which um, there will be particular categories of people who it's easier to recruit um, who may not be sort of uh, uh, ideal in other terms, and uh, and compromises will have to be made. Um, but yeah. Um, but then, you know, in the end, I sort of say, well, what's the alternative? If, if, well, if there's a better alternative, um, I, I, yeah, I. I just I, I now get to the larger question of um, you know whether we should be, I, you know, I'm just divided myself on this, but to what degree we should be trying to establish democratic deliberations all over the world, right. um, or actually going at the incredible inequalities. Uh, which it seems to me makes almost all discussion can be very fruitless when you have such power um, differences that perhaps our energies as political theorists should be focused on, you know, good old days of just attacking, you know, these extreme inequalities. And it, it doesn't seem to me that's the same project. It might be just elaborating new accounts, alternatives. But it's not, it doesn't seem to me the same project. I'm not saying they're mutually exclusive, but it's not the same project as setting up uh, deliberative you know, discourses wherever you can. And uh, so I was just wondering what you would yeah. say to that. Um, I mean, maybe we, because it does seem to me a little bit like the, the Western model of talking a lot, especially academic talking a lot, we're sort of transferring to all these other places. And I, it might be better just to leave the people alone. <laughs> After all, we're doing, we're doing a lot of damage, and our corporations are doing a lot of it. Maybe just, you know, get them out, or yeah. something of that sort. Yeah. yeah. But in, in terms of... Well, well I, I know, but I mean, talking is, yeah. you know... Is um, the, Okay, just two, I mean, two, yeah. two points. Um, yeah. Why not just attack the inequalities? Um, that, that assumes that we know what the best way to attack them is. Um, well, that and, could... And I'm not sure... I'm not sure. Really, and so that's um, so. If we don't, then I, th I think in, in involving the more marginalised um, uh, in the uh, in, in deliberation about what the best means is, is still um, is still justifiable. Um, and in terms of um, you know talking a lot being as a kind of a Western intellectualist model, um, I think I disagree. But um, actually, I wrote a cause a paper that's published in um, the journal Political Theory this, earlier this year on deliberative cultures, um, which is a preliminary attempt to, um, uh, to think about the, um, the, the, the diverse cultural roots of deliberation. Um, and what we, um, actually what we argue in that, that paper, um, but, um, we have, of course, we have every, every culture in the world, which has been highly selective. Um, uh, is that um, deliberation is in fact a universal human competence um, that is manifested uh, in very different ways, um, in diff different societies and diff different cultures. Um, so I, I really don't think that it's, uh, you know, it's a sort of a Western intellectual. No, but I mean discourse ethics or you know certain models. Yeah, I, I, I know. I, I agree, and that's and that's yeah. what pro that's what's problematic um, yeah. about. Um, so, you know, discourse ethics comes from Habermas. Um, Habermas thinks that deliberative democracy is really uh, 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 most, of, well, it really is its home. It's in, um, it's in uh, modern liberal societies. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think that's, that's true. Um, I think that um, the theory of deliberative democracy ought to be uh, delinked from that, that, uh, that type of association. Uh, Omar. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a kind of a global question along the line of one syllable, the second syllable. Um, and I, I apologize, I missed the first five minutes, so perhaps you can answer it. Well, right. answered all the questions. <laughs> At least answered mine. <laughs> yes, yes, right. fast. But my global concern is uh, fairly simple. It's what do you mean by global justice? Or put it slightly yeah. differently, why do you believe there is such a thing as global justice? And I actually agree with your main thesis that it has a lot to do with democracy. So I'm assuming that the only definition I heard you use along the way was self-interest, which I take it you're not that pleased with. So I'm assuming that democracy and justice are much more inextricably linked. So my question is this. It seems there's a much easier and more direct linkage between the two concepts than the one that you offered. Yeah. Uh, you're going to recognize it when I describe it, so I just uh, harping it for your comment. What do you, what do you think of? So in a kind of flat-footed way, let's say democracy is ruled by the people. Mm -hmm. Standard definition. So the principle of global 
justice is that all people should be self aware. That's it. Okay. Comment? Um, that, that would be one way to define global it justice. It is definitely one way. But it's only one way. And it would be, uh, uh, I think it would be contested um, by a lot of uh, the people who, who would um, sort of advocate particular substantive models of, um, of global justice. Um, so I, um, uh, I, I'm actually, um, in terms of the substantive content of, of, of global justice, I, I'm actually um, a bit agnostic. Um, the, the way I put it in the paper is that the, uh, it's just a quote from the second <laughs> sentence, um, the subject of justice is the allocation of benefits and burdens such as rights and responsibilities, um, especially when it comes to the basic structure of society. Um, that's the subject of justice. That just um, uh, involves a, a domain of, of things that one should consider under the, under the heading of justice. Um, and, and that's probably as, as far as I, could, I would go in defining substantively what, what justice, um, what justice actually, uh, actually, actually means. Well, can I just rephrase it? Why isn't democracy what justice is? That's basically what I'm saying. Sorry, why isn't democracy what? Self-rule. Um, yeah, okay. Self-determination. Um, you know that. Yeah, um, I, I think, um, uh, you know, even as a democratic theorist, I, that, that's, I've worked in the theory of democracy a long time, um, come to justice relatively rather, late. Um, but I recognize that there, is, there, there can be more to justice than, than democracy. Uh, that, uh, that, that right, just, as a place to start. Sorry? As a place All to right, start. Right. Yeah. I want to jump in because my question is related, not that I want to argue um, that, that democracy is meaning and justice, but several times in the talk, you talk about the importance of, uh, in terms of generative agents that are going to be determining the meaning of justice. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what you mean by that. How much uh, do, do, is it necessary to agree on the meaning of justice? By that, I hope you don't mean that they have to agree on a theory of justice, because then it's hopeless. Right. People all over the world are going to have to agree on, you know, whether uh, Rawls or Pogge or, uh, you know, so it can mean that. Right? Right. You can have that requirement of, uh, of of a full agreement, even on what do you mean? So on a conception of justice, even that's going to be problematic. I mean, is that required for all of these deliberative forums that they're going to have to? So obviously, you need something at a more intermediate level or a more practical yeah. level than that. Uh, mm -hmm. But you never really specified what you expect them to agree to as generative yeah. agents. Yeah. And I, I just am wary of anything that's too demanding because uh, we're going to have to wait for this agreement before we can implement any before any, any practical measures that's going to be adopted. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, it certainly wouldn't be um, requiring people to agree on whether, whether Rawls' theory is right or... Uh, <laughs> Obviously, I know uh, you don't mean that, but so just... You know, uh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that. Um, so, uh, so I think um, it, it means... Uh, it, its connotation is, is much, much more practical. Um, so it would, it would involve um, things like um, deciding what in a, in a particular, uh, I don't know, in, in a, I think, yeah, say, a, a, a particular negotiation, whether um, justice uh, really is best served by um, a transfer of resources from rich to poor, um, or whether we should think um, more about raising particular capabilities of the poor. I mean, that's, um, I know sort of capabilities will get, get the language there is, um, um, is, is, is Sen and Nussbaum, but you, you can sort of think about those things without necessarily sort of worrying about the, um, the, the, the whole theory of capabilities. Um, or, whether, or whether it might um, involve um, uh, just, yeah, just in, enabling access, um, access of the, the poor people in question to, um, to, to broaden markets for their products and things that they um, grow or, or, or make. Um, so, um, so that's that's really what I'm. I, th I think um, so. It, it's mu I think it's much closer to the. Um, it's much much closer to the ground. It's context specific. Um, it would um, it wouldn't be in any abstract sense. Um, it would refer to what, whatever um, whatever particular topic um, was a, was at hand in some kind of some kind of some kind of political uh, political setting. 
But then it's sort of like what justice requires, rather than meaning justice. Um, meaning no, I, I think it can still. Um, I, I, I think it can. I mean, if, if it's not meaning in the sense of, again, it's sort of not meaning in 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 in, in, in the sense of, um, you know, ultimately what philosophical conception of justice we're uh, we're applying here. But um, I think it's, it can be meaning in, um, in in some kind of concrete sense because, um, in, I mean, essentially it comes down to well, what what should we what should be done? Um, but it, it doesn't assume. I mean, the important thing is it doesn't assume that we know in advance what should be done. And that's when um, that that's where I would um, depart. I think from somebody like O'Neill, who, who when she starts with primary agents of justice, um, um, assumes that we already know. Um, what needs to be done, and that um, somebody has somebody has decided that, and therefore the obligation to promote uh, uh, that conception of justice, and then then rest upon particular agents. Um, um, all I'm suggesting is that we that, that, that we don't know that in advance, um, and so it is possible to um, uh, conduct dialogue uh, about. Um, about what justice means, and not not necessarily in just not not in the language of, of philosophy, but in um, a very very sort of concrete language that um, uh, would use a lot in the way of, um, uh, of, of practical examples, would, um, would draw on lived experience. But it's nevertheless, I, th I think um, it really is. It really, it really can be a dialogue about um, what what justice means. Okay. Um, and did you have a question? I did, but it was, it's been covered. Okay. I think we can take one or two no, more. No, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Kevin Elliott from uh, Columbia University, PhD uh, candidate there. Um, my main worry here is, is primarily that um, in, in naming, you know, these, these different uh, agents of, of justice, um, if I tried to count up the number of citizens that this actually, you know, encompassed, um, by and large, if you leave out four, um, it's, a, it's a fairly small group that we're that we're talking about. Um, and and I, uh, my overall concern with the sort of deliberative systems approach um, on this on this specific issue is that we're ultimately talking about a very small participation um, portal. Uh, it looks a lot like we're bootstrapping a very small um, voice of the people to other what what is you know sort of system of uh, global policy making insofar as such a thing exists, um, one that is based on states and based on these international organizations. Um, in, in your response to the gentleman's questions here, you were talking about how the problem arises when we try and get the, uh, you know, linking, uh, link up these different kinds of deliberative forums to international organizations and, and you recognize that there's going to be very large problems with that. I think that that's right. And those problems might be sufficient that we're not going to have anything like global justice without really fundamentally tearing down these uh, these existing organizations and the state system. And, and really, like you know, if you want to take seriously global justice, it seems like the implications of that are, are much are, are much more demanding in terms of participation than than uh, you know a small group of citizens assemblies. A hundred people representing a nation state is kind of a laughable degree of, of participation. It seems like. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, obviously there's a, you know, one, one can look at something like a deliberative system, and as you, as you suggested, um, uh, it's very easy, easy to point to the, uh, the relatively small number of people um, actually involved in it. Um, I mean, that's, pro that's probably, I mean, that applies that at the national level, no less um, than, the, than, than the global level. Um, but the um, I, th I think what, what I what I what I would argue is that okay we, we could imagine some kind of ideal world in which the existing structure was um, was torn down in which uh, we, we did somehow have um, uh, sort of billions of people participating in some way in um, in global governance but that is so far. From the world which which we currently inhabit, um, I'm I'm not sure how productive it is in even thinking about it. So, um, so I mean, this, this wasn't in the paper, but my my my, my own approach to um, sort of, uh, 
democratic theory and practice um, concerns, well, it, it largely involves sort of starting with where we are now and thinking, well, what, what can be done to move it in this, um, in this more democratic direction? And then when we've got there, what can be done again and again and again and again? Um, so, um, so that implies a commitment to, um, yeah, it's a very reflexive process, um, which is open-ended, um, and that's why I, um, that's why I actually sort of resist the the language of models of democracy. Um, I would never claim to have a model of democracy. Um, I, all I would say is that um, I hope that what I do can speak to processes of democratization. And once you start speaking in um, process of democratization, um, those processes have to start from somewhere. And uh, I, I think the most productive somewhere is the world as it is now, um, rather than uh, sort of envisaging some radically, you know, um, radically different kind of, kind of world. I can't meet everybody's material needs, but I can meet your material needs for food and drink. So I suggest we uh, thank John Drasset for his. <laughs>